Lenore St. Christ is our associate here. I've known Brad ever since he's been three years old. We go back for quite a while. Uh, when we moved from Lexington, Kentucky to the Elizabethan Tennessee Church, the Centerview Church in Elizabethan, and became very good friends with Brad's family. And Brad seems like he's part of, of my family. I'll just adopt him as a, a son. He's a very fine young man. He recently married April Cooper from Indianapolis, Indiana. April's a very fine Christian lady. Uh, Brad is a graduate of East Tennessee State University. He has a degree in communications. He also has graduated from the Tri-City School of Preaching. And uh, he's an excellent preacher. He's an excellent Bible student. He, though he doesn't have a great love for controversy, he's not scared of it. And he will take a stand regarding controversial issues in difficult times. And so Brad, Brad, we're very happy this. We're very happy that you're speaking on the lectureship here. Come preach the word to us. It's indeed uh, an honor to be able to be here with you today. I want to thank uh, the elders here, Brother Stevens, Brother Roth, and uh, Brother Bond, uh, for the invitation to be here. I thank uh, Brother David Brown uh, for the good work he does here. Obviously, Brother Kent and the elders at Lenore City, I appreciate them as well. This is uh, this Tennessee boy's first time in Texas. I've enjoyed it so far. And uh, the great states of Tennessee and Texas have had a great fellowship throughout here. Uh, I think of the Alamo and Sam Houston and Davy Crockett, and uh, in the uh, not so recent past, the year 2000, uh, the state of Tennessee came to the aid of a Texan, uh, George W. Bush. And so uh, it's good to be here uh, with my fellow Texans as a uh, Tennessean. It's good to be here with you. At preach sure I appreciate also all the uh, the faithful men who have been for a long time, and I've been able to. Uh, learn and glean from them while, while I've been and, uh, and to know them. I appreciate their hard work and uh, their sufferings for the cause of Christ. As a young man, I understand my limitations in knowledge and ability and experience, and, and so it's been very edifying for me to be able to listen to you and to learn from you and your writing and uh, know that you are greatly appreciated. But as great as the uh, edification is here and as great as the fellowship is here, I can't wait to get home uh, to see my April, my wife. Uh, she's been a great blessing from God. We married in December, so I'm looking forward to getting home to be with her. Uh, I leave tomorrow. I've been assigned the topic uh, dealing with a book review of the book, I Just Want to Be a Christian, written by Rubel Shep. In regards to fellowship, the doctrine of fellowship has been and it continues to be misunderstood and perverted. There are those who do not want to ship anybody. There are those who want to fellowship everybody. And there are those who don't care fellowship with who. The Bible teaches that God decides who is in fellowship with him. In 1 John 1, verses 6 and verse 7, if we say we have fellowship with him, that is God, but we walk in darkness, we lie, and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. Those who are in fellowship with God are those who have lived a life of obedience to his word. Those who are obedient to God's word are those then who are in fellowship with one another. And so God defines who's in fellowship, with who? Uh, man does not have the right to devise his own plan of fellowship. Man does not have the right to devise the conditions uh, for fellowship. Those who are faithful to God are in fellowship with him and they're in fellowship with each other. Those who are disobedient to God are not in fellowship with him, but they, are, uh, they do share a fellowship with other disobedient individuals. Of course, we've read 2, 9 through 11, and that will be mentioned uh, through this lectureship. But whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ has not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, the Bible says, Receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. For he that biddeth him Godspeed is a partaker 
on his evil deeds. He's in fellowship with his evil deeds. Sadly, men have handled this Bible doctrine of fellowship with contempt. One such mockery of biblical fellowship can be seen in the book, I Just Want to Be a Christian, written by Rubel Shelley. On page of his book, Shelley states that the book is an attempt to address the important issue of oneness among Christians from a biblical point of view. Shelley, in his book, does address fellowship and unity. Unfortunately, it has nothing to do with the Bible. It is not scriptural in any way, and therefore it does not come from a biblical point of view. He states uh, on page 133 of his book, don't take the thesis of this little document to be that we have it all worked out and want you to come over and accept our traditions and intentions of Scripture. My question is, what is there that needs to be worked out? Why would we want to follow our traditions anyway, rather than simply obeying what God has stated in his book, the Bible? In regards to unity and fellowship, God worked it out. And so we don't have to, and we shouldn't want to. We simply want to do as God has commanded in the Bible. His word is settled in heaven, Psalm 119, It will judge us on the last day, John 12, verse 48. But Shelley also promotes his view of fellowship in this book when he writes, Error, per se, does not exclude one from participation in the blessings of Christ. Now, if error does not exclude one from the blessings of Christ, what will? What will? God said through his prophet Isaiah, Behold, my hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither my ear heavy that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God. Your sins have hid his face from him that he will not hear. Now, according to the Bible, does error separate man from God? So we already see that what Rubel Shelley has written in his book is not biblical. It doesn't stand in harmony. Is Shelley discussing oneness, as he stated, from a biblical point of view? Well, no, obviously not. And so it is these questions that the answer needs to be given. And it is these questions that uh, show need and the importance of such a book review about this uh, book and why it could lead weak Christians away from the faith and lead some who are not members of the church not to even search for the truth. And so we do need a good book review of this book, I Just Want to Be a Christian. Though there are many statements and inaccuracies and strange ideology throughout this book, the remainder of the manuscript and this lecture will deal primarily with three points. The first thing I want us to look at is the major themes that Rubel Shelley uses in his book that are used to uh, confound the reader, to confuse the reader into seeing it his way. And the second thing I want to do is just offer a general review of the book. And thirdly, I want us to look and disclose some uh, relatively recent events that Rubel Shelley has been involved with his behavior will allow us to see kind of uh, insight into what he was writing in 1984. A book, I Just Want to Be a Christian. The first major theme used by Rubel Shelley to confuse the reader is his title. <laughs> the title, I Just Want to Be a Christian, is an excellent title, and it is biblical. And there's not a faithful Christian anywhere uh, who would title, I Just Want to Be a Christian. The desire to just want to be a Christian is an admirable one, and all faithful Christians would hope that others, uh, even those outside the body of Christ, would want to have that uh, same mentality. I just want to be a Christian. In fact, I wish some brethren would just want to be a Christian and not anything else. But, you know, if someone told me I just want to be a Christian, my response would be just be one. Rochelle's response is a bunch of mumbo-jumbo, but it has nothing to do with the biblical doctrine uh, He doesn't make the same reply that I would. He uses his statement to promote his false view on fellowship and deciding who is a Christian rather than teach the Bible commands in regards to being a Christian. In his author, or uh, in his preface, 
to the book. He states that the churches of Christ are not growing generally. Our image in the parts of the United States where we are best known is quite poor, that is usually known for what we are against, and accused of thinking everyone but us is going to hell. And we are so splintered over so many issues, notice, from instrumental music to church cooperation to translations of scripture, that no one takes us seriously as a, quote, unity movement. Honestly, I'm glad no one considers the Church of Christ to be a unity movement because that's not what it is. The Church of Christ is not a unity movement. It is the only blood-bought institution of Jesus the Christ. And it's the only Bible the same on this earth. Not a unity movement. Shelley's uh, statement also implies that the use of mechanical instruments of music, work, matters of church cooperation, and translations of Scripture should not be a hindrance to unity. Now that's the obvious location of his statement, that we're splintered over those things, and the idea he gives is we shouldn't be. God abhors the mechanical in music and worship. He abhors it because he commands and it only that men sing and make melody in his heart, Ephesians 5.19 and Colossians 3.16. Also, in reference to church cooperation, God in the uh, extremes of anti-church cooperation and, on the other hand, unbridled liberal church cooperation both cause severe division in the church and are disdained by God. Uh, many so-called translations of Scripture are actually made perverse. They're leading people away from the true soul-saving message of the gospel. Now, these are not silly issues to God. They're not splintering issues in the church. They are uh, damning souls. Shelley's argument also fails to comply with God's commands for fellowship. There can be no unity with only division. And the idea that we can all agree to disagree is a worldly uh, profession concocted by Satan. In Amos 3.3, 3, the question is asked, can two walk together except to be agreed? Shelley contends that a Christian is one who merely believes, quote, in the atonement of Jesus' blood and who have been baptized in his name, page 23. Shelley pleads for these individuals to stand together as one body. The problem with Shelley's definition of a Christian is that it is not in harmony with God's Word. There are many Baptists and members of Christian church denomination who believe in the atonement and they have been baptized by their uh, own statements or their definitions, but that doesn't make them a child of God. The Methodists offer pouring and sprinkling and consider that to be baptism when God defined baptism as a burial, Romans 6.4. Colossians 2 and verse 12, and defined that burial into much water, John 3 to 3. Generally speaking, Baptist and the Christian church denomination teach that baptism is not essential for salvation uh, when God said that it is, Mark 16, 16, Acts 2, 38, 1 Peter 3, 21. Individuals in the denominations cannot be uh, or cannot stand together as one body as Rubel Shelley calls upon them to do, but they've done what he said they needed to do to be a Christian. But they can't stand together as one body because they're all teaching different things. And they're not in agreement on the Bible, on what the Bible teaches. They teach different false doctrines in regards to salvation. They don't even define the church the same. And so how can they be a member of the same body when they don't even define it the same? Christians, uh, members of the Church of Christ, cannot stand together as a body with them either. We can't stand as one body with denominations because denominations pervert God's word and damnable heresies, and that's Second John 9 through 11. Shelley also asserts that one does not need to know for what purpose he's being baptized in order to be a Christian. You can read the implication on pages 103 through 106 of his book. The dangerous implication from this position is that one could be from his past sins and not even know it. Not even know it. He could be added to the church of Christ, the body which Jesus died for, and not even know it. Now that's the implication of what he said. If you don't have to know the purpose of baptism, 
the logical conclusion of his argument is that anyone who has been immersed in water, regardless of and some despite the reasoning for being is a Christian. The conclusion is false, and it is no wonder how that Rubel finds himself in fellowship with denominations by making this definition of a Christian. He states that there are sincere, knowledgeable, and devout Christians scattered among the various denominations, page 132. Now, since sincere, knowledgeable, and devout Christians would repent of sin of leaving the church, that's what sincere, devout, uh, and faith Christians would do. They wouldn't be scattered among denominations. They would repent of leaving the church for which Christ died, and they would repent of being in a man-made denomination. If there are Christians who have left the church or in a denomination, they're in sin, and they're not sincere, knowledgeable, and devout. Otherwise, they'd repent and get out of their sin and come back home. There are no faithful Christians in any denomination. Any Christian who has joined and continues in a denomination is not in fellowship with God. All faithful Christians are members of the Church of Christ. I think a title for the book Rubel Shelley has written should be, I just want to fellowship everybody. Not, I just want to be a Christian, but I just want to fellowship everybody. And so I'm going to define Christian. I'm speaking of Rubel Shelley. He wants to define Christian so that he can fellowship everybody. The major theme Shelley used in his book is regarding the American Restoration Movement of the 1800s. On pages 6 and 7, Shelley states the movement, that is the American uh, Restoration Movement, divided into three major streams, the Disciples of Christ, the Conservative Christian Church, and the Churches of Christ. There are different splinter groups within each of these three. Estimates range from 21 to over 50 splinters as to the total number of subs which have emerged from his historical movement for unity among Christians. Some within a given subgroup will not even acknowledge others within a different subgroup as children of God, much less any who are outside their his whole heritage. Now, have you heard any worse bunch of junk in your life? You won't read stuff like that in the Bible. You won't read anything like that in the Bible. Rubel Shelley first appeals to a false view of the Restoration Movement. His whole idea of the Restoration Movement is wrong. Uh, he appeals to the Restoration Movement authority, and that is wrong. The previous quotation has many flaws. Let's look at just a few of them. First, it's not from the Restoration Movement or any other earthly movement that the Church of Christ exists. The Church of Christ was established on the day of Pentecost, the first Pentecost, and the burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ, not by any earthly movement. It is not from the Restoration Movement we get any authority for what we do or speak. If men in the Restoration Movement, or for that matter, men today write good material, it's not them from, when we get, from whom we get the authority. It's from Jesus Christ and the Bible. The American Restoration was not a unity movement. It was a movement to uh, get back solely to the Bible, which is kind of uh, considering what Rubel Shelley is doing in his book. And so uh, he's wrong in what the plea of the Restoration Movement was. The plea was simply to get back to the Bible for all authority. Now, some men in the Restoration Movement didn't make it all the way back. Now, with the plea of wanting to get back to just what the Bible is, Obviously, unity would be a result of that. If everyone is speaking the same things and in the same mind and same judgment, we're all going to be on the same page, and therefore you have unity. But you have the right standard. Uh, Jesus taught that his message would not just uh, be among brethren, but that it would lead to division in some cases. It said that uh, Jesus said his followers would be hated of all men, Matthew 10, verse 22, would be set, uh, his message would set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against his mother, or her mother, the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man shall shall be they of his own household, Matthew 10, 35 and 36. And so the message of Christ is not, not a unity movement. In some cases, it'll cause him. 
the majority of those involved in the restoration looking for unity as Shelley asserts. Rather, they were looking to get back to simple Bible authorized practice. And fourth, there are no inner groups or subgroups concomitant with the Church of Christ. There's only one church. There's only one body. That's Ephesians 4, verse 4, and Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. And you're either a member of the one body or you're not. You're not a member of a subgroup or a splinter group, and that just doesn't exist. So that's a false statement in his quote. Fifth, the disciples of Christ, conservative Christian church, and their king subgroups are not children of God. One can only be a child of God by obeying God's plan to save and be added by God to his church. Those who have followed plans of salvation concocted in are not added to the body of Christ, and therefore they are not joint heirs with Christ, Romans 8, 17. And also in this, Shelley blasphemously placed the church of Christ in the same realm as the Christian church and the disciples of Christ, just like any other denomination. He's placing the church for which Christ died in the same category as those who made denominations, and that's blasphemy. Sixth, according to his quote, Christianity and fellowship are not determined by historical heritage. He said uh, these splinter groups come up by historical heritage, and group, some subgroups won't even fellowship subgroups because of historical heritage, but that's not what determines whether one is a Christian or not, someone's history. One is determined to be a Christian by God. The individual submits to God's conditions for salvation and then subsequently walks in harmony with his will. The fellowship with Christ and other Christians is determined by, 1 John 1, 7, if we walk in the light as he is in the light. It is also important to note that exposing Shelley's misrepresentation of certain men of the Restoration Movement, as well as their writings in his is not an indictment against them or their writings. Shelley skillfully and manipul manipulatively sets the writings of those men inside his to imply that they're saying the same things, when many times they weren't. Sadly, uh, this implication mentions quotes and teachings uh, that would imply that he is on the same page as these men when they were not. The course of those restoration years should be admired, and we should be appreciative for uh, the good work that many of them did. But get our authority from them, and many of them uh, didn't go far enough, as we know in, in our study. And so we don't get our authority from them. The church didn't spring out of the movement, an earth, any earthly movement, but these pioneers uh, uh, should, of course, to get the Bible authority, and we should appreciate that. But uh, any further than that, uh, we're not looking at the restoration movement as a unity movement because that's not, not what its plea was. Its plea was to get back to Bible and Bible teaching and for leading towards unity, but not unity at the expense of the truth. The third major theme used in Shelley's composition is what he calls foundation matters, page 48. This, along with such phrases as fundamental teachings, universal and essential, essential element, fundamental issues, are all what I call rubble speak for things which he has determined necessary or of importance uh, in salvation ship. This rubble speak allows him to ignore the majority of the Bible doctrine of fellowship, of what he has uh, amounted to uh, just a religious club. Everybody fellowshipping everybody. A significant observation must be made here that one can be religious being righteous. Webb defines religion as a specific form of belief or practice. Therefore, one who adheres to a specific form of belief is said to be religious. But on the other hand, righteousness is defined as holy and upright living in accordance with God's standard. The word righteousness comes from a root word that means straightness. It refers to a state that uh, conforms to an authoritative standard. Since one can practice a form of belief that is not in accordance with God's word, then one can be religious without 
being righteous. Rubel's fellowship policy is a specific form of belief or a practice, uh, but it does not comply with the will of God. His code is a test to the fact that there are certain matters which he does not deem to be essential or worthy of consideration. Who gave Rubel Shelley the authority to decide what in the New Testament is essential and what is not? I think it's so humorously that, uh, or humorous that Shelley makes the observation that those who have the audacity to fellowship as office by God, uh, he quotes, he is quoted as saying, these people are being divisive by forcing us about non-essential matters on others. Why I think that's humorous is, I suppose he thought that while he was penning this sentence, he was forcing his views as to who divisive in regards to forcing uh, non-essential matters. See, he says we're forcing fellowship over non-essential matters, but it's he who's forcing his what non-essential is. This attitude uh, is a postmodern attitude, and it's running rampant in our society, and it is uh, an attitude that is creeping into the church. The cry for tolerance towards every opinion and idea except towards uh, the idea that they're wrong. <laughs> when someone claims that they are wrong, they're not very tolerant of that viewpoint. You're to be tolerant towards their view as long as you don't tell them they're wrong. Our viewpoint that they're wrong in accordance with the scripture is not one that they will allow. The purpose of Rubel speak uh, uh, is very clear. Once he uh, read through the book and realize that he starts uh, showing doubt as to whether one can really know what essential is. So he's used these phrases, non-essential and fundamental, and then you start reading further and you realize he says that you can't really find out what's essential. According to Shelley, he's, uh, quote, the difficulty of special note has to do with distinguishing a matter of faith from one of opinion. If it, it is difficult to find two brothers who agree about what belongs in each category. What one regards as a matter of faith, another treats as an opinion and vice versa. Now that should sound familiar to us in this day and time. There are many in the brotherhood today claiming the exact same thing. We can't really know whether it's a matter of judgment, a matter of opinion, or whether it's a matter of doctrine. Once faithful men now have no problem extending the right hand of fellowship to fosters and those who support aid parachurch organizations because it is hard for them to distinguish a matter of faith from one of opinion. Anytime these once faithful preachers are called upon to defend their position, they either ignore the call in violation of 1 Peter 3.15, or they proclaim that it is a matter of opinion and we should not consider fellowship matter. How sad that history is repeating itself. Sad. Shelley further pronounces his declaration of foundation matters by stating, a Christian breaks his or her fellowship with the body by embracing a doctrine which denies one or more of the essential elements of the Christian faith. These essential elements are the fundamental issues identified by Paul in his famous unity passage of Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. Shelley says, my suggestion is that only such items as pertain directly to the seven ones of Ephesians 4, 4 through 6 are of such a qualify as issues of faith, that is, doctrinal tests of fellowship. With one stroke of the pen, Rubel Shelley has attempted to slice out every passage in the New Testament regarding fellowship except for Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. And he has deemed only Ephesians 4, 4 through 6 as what we should use as a standard of doctrinal fellowship. He further, by implication, uh, labels all other scripture as non-essential. I mean, he, he intended to do that. But by implication, when he says this is all that's essential, he's labeled the rest of the scripture non-essential. Consider the following verses. They continued steadfast in the apostles' doctrine and breaking of bread and fellowship and in prayers. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness 
and singleness of heart, Acts 2, 42 and 46. Be ye not unequally yoked with unbelievers, 2 Corinthians 6, 14. Have no sh fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but reprove them, Ephesians 5, 11. That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ, 1 John 1, 3, and then, of course, 1 John 1, 6 and 7. If we walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. If we walk in the light, we have fellowship one with another in him. How is it that Rubel Shelley and others can, with good conscience, teach to convince people that these verses I just and many others are not needed and do not need to be considered in relationship or in relation to fellowship with God? Why would anyone even follow foolish doctrine? A doctrine which implies that the entirety of the New Testament other than Ephesians 4, verses 4 through 6, is not foundational, is not fundamental things and not universal and essential. This philosophy blames God, His Word, and Christ died to enact His will and the Holy Spirit who revealed it. Shelley penned nice the New Testament. I put the cross for Jeremiah 36 there. He attempts to cut out parts of the New Testament that deal with fellowship. He says, we are not commissioned by the Lord to promote a particular name or a particular interpretations about organization, worship, and work in the local church. He further, uh, Shelley further said, the one faith, of Ephesians 4, has nothing to do with our methods and procedures of doing God's work. This is an attack against the pattern of the New Testament. According to this school of thought, one could be a member of a denomination without any fear of condemnation. If the Bible does not proclaim a pattern, or as he put it, a particular set of interpretations about organization, about worship, and about uh, the work of the church, how many know which church was the church for which Christ died? Every man could do that which in his own eyes without any regard to any teaching. It's ironic that Shelley would appeal to the Restoration Movement earlier in his book, which stressed getting back to the old paths for his authority and then deny the new pattern for organization, worship, and the work of the church. If what Shelley was true, there would be absolutely no way to distinguish the church for which Christ died from a man-made denomination. If there was a pattern for organization, work, or worship. <coughs> Further, Shelley declares that the one faith has nothing to do with methods and procedures. How then could you have just one faith? If, if everyone comes in procedures, then that many faiths. And so Ephesians 4 says there's one faith, and if that faith has nothing to do with methods and procedures, then it can't be just one because everybody has one. Now, when I say everybody, I'm talking about the religious world. Denominations have their own set pattern of the way they do things. Therefore, Ephesians 4, 4, the faith mentioned there can't be regarding personal faith. Everyone has to have a personal faith, Hebrews 11:6. 6. It's impossible to please God without faith. The faith mentioned in Ephesians 4, 4, then must be the system of faith. There's only one system of faith. Or there can't be many organizations. That's he's in. There can't be many acts of worship. And there can't be uh, unauthorized works with different local congregations. That would be chaos. And God's not the author of confusion. He also said that we're not commissioned to teach this pattern. God sure did commission man to teach this pattern. He commissioned just defend the New Testament. They that gladly this word were baptized the same day were added to them about 3,000 souls. Acts 2 verse 42, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And so there is a pattern and there is a set uh, particular standard for organization, uh, for worship, and for the church. My time is running out quickly, so uh, my general review of the book, 
uh, you can read in the manuscript. But I'm going to skip on to uh, the last part, dealing with some of the things that Rubel Shelley has been engaged with uh, in the recent past that will allow us to understand some of the things that he wrote uh, in 1884 in his book, I Just Want to Be a Christian. Where Rubel Shelley stood in 1984 and where now is actually the same place. It's just he's talking about it differently. In 1984, he used his code phrases and his Rubel speak to kind of hide where he stood. Today, he's not ashamed of what he's standing for. Just prior to the printing of his book, Bull repented in the truth in a very well-known uh, lecture in Centerville, Tennessee. Knowing where Rubel Shelley stands now, as I mentioned, will help us understand she wrote the book in 1984. Rubel Shelley, since then, has welcomed the member of denominations, world religions, into fellowship. In 1995, Shelley appeared on a forum with a Muslim imam and a Jewish rabbi. In the newspaper article of that forum, uh, the article was entitled, Spiritual Lives Are United by Faith. Shelley is quoted as saying that Christians should not be, quote, blindly dogmatic and judgmental because the business of judging the final destination of people's souls is God's knowledge. Though Rubel is correct in regards to who makes the final judgment, he is in his assessment that Christians cannot judge with whom they are and are in fellowship. Jesus commanded that we judge judgment, John 7:24. Eleven years after that statement, he was sharing the stage with two men, one claiming to be a Jew and the other a Muslim, who both that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And the quote I want to uh, mention is this. He said on page 5 of his book, If one sin is a false doctrine which denies the deity of Christ, there can be no fellowship for a moment. So in 1984, he says, there's no fellowship with those who deny the deity of Christ. In 1995, he shares the stage with two men who, just, who do just that. Rubel asked that same Muslim imam in 2001 to speak at Woodmont Hills Church of Christ in Nashville, where Shelley was the preacher. The speaking engagement was at a midday prayer service underneath the four men bowed together in prayer with Captain Imam Ilyas Muhammad at right, Steve Brumfield, uh, Mark Black, and Woodmont Hills Minister Rubel Shelley pray together at Woodmont Hills Church of Christ on Franklin Road. Now, this is appalling because prayer is a privilege only to those who are children of God. It is only a th it is only a privilege that is shared in fellowship among those who have obedient God. And here Shelley was, quote-unquote, praying with men who don't even believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And that's appalling that he would do so. Muslims deny the very sacrifice uh, that allows reconciliation between man and God. But by bowing together with a Muslim, Rubel Shelley claimed fellowship and brotherhood with a man who totally rejects the true God of heaven because Muslims worship a false god they call Allah, who doesn't exist. In inclusion, it's sad that a once faithful brother in Christ uh, has written such a piece of trash. I, I would have loved to have been to a book by Rubel Shelley on fellowship and got up here and bragged on it and said this is a wonderful book on fellowship but his book is out of harmony with God's will. And it was not my desire to be mean uh, or to deride his for pleasure. My pleasure would have been to say these things are in accordance with God's will, but they're just not. It speaks no truth about Christian fellowship. More than 20 years ago, some fathers showed little or no regard for Rubel Shelley's false teachings. And some to the extent of even defending Shelley. Uh, their defense has allowed them to be seen a, a little silly because, and, and they're probably ashamed of defending him now. But sadly, there are men in our brotherhood today who are defending false teachers like many did 20 years ago with Shelley. And they are uh, allowing these things to go on because they either claim that it's a big misunderstanding 
or it's, a, it's all a matter of opinion, or that the false teacher is being unjustly treated by radicals. Some of those early defenders of Shelley probably look back at those days with shame and embarrassment. And there are some men today who are reporting, defending, or ignoring a false teacher and his sympathizers who will very uh, likely look back 20 from now and have that same embarrassment and shame. Uh, it's our that all faithful Christians uh, and uh, all those who are unfaithful, Rubel Shelley and Falters and those that support them, repent so that they can have fellowship with God again. So we appreciate the good message that's been preached. It encourages me to see younger men coming along and standing up for the truth who are well grounded in the faith and with the courage to say these things. None of us are ever happy to have to deal with things like this. But love demands you deal with the hurtful things as well as happy things. That's sometimes a few people don't have a biblical love. And yet he who loved does not comprehend when he gave heaven to become a man. That within itself was a sacrifice we can't grasp to actually come into his own creation and to become a man. Much less all the truth. And then finally culminating in the cross and the agonies and shame that was there. Yet that was love. If you ever ask the question, Ask yourself the question, what would God do if he were a man like I am? You've already got the answer. Read Matthew, Mark, Mark Luke, and John. And there it is. So when you've got people who do like Rubel Shelley, and he's just an example of so many, then don't let it move you away from the fact you can know the truth and the Bible hasn't changed no matter what anybody does. I don't care whether Rubel Shelley or anybody else. The Bible's the same now as it was 50 years ago, 1,000 years ago since it's been we ought to take great comfort in that and not be moved away from the hope of the, and the truth of the gospel by the people. One point we ought to always keep in mind, the first step away from the truth on any subject is always the worst step because on that step is all are all the other steps that error built. And once you start moving for whatever reason, away from truth, it becomes easier to take the second and third and the fourth step. You harden your heart a little more, you sear your conscience a little more, and for it just it's just the way of the digression. And it becomes easier to do it. We just can't allow that to happen. So when I hear people saying, well, it's just a little sin or it's just a little thing, uh, tell that to us. Tell that to Nadab and Abihu. Why have we preached sermons on saying, it had to be gopher wood. If you think of the way some people are trying to reason today that are not out there where Uber Chevy is, how do they preach these sermons on us anymore? Think about it, wasn't it? A, a good fellow. And they were trying to transport that ark the way humans think and not counting the truth of God. We learned that. Why, well, he did almost out of a natural reflex, probably any of us would do. When the oxen stumbled, he just stopped the ark. We killed him. Well, can you think of things like that? That is the thing. What was God saying to us? Things were written before time for our learning regarding our attitude, any obligatory matter in the New Testament. So when we reach a stage where we say, well, that's a thing, or it happened 20 years ago, uh, no, that's not a big We can put up with that. That first step that says, if I can put up with that, I can put up with two errors, three errors, five eight errors. Finally, the Bible becomes that love letter, the way they define it, just telling you God loves you. God the Father, Jesus is our Savior. You can't save yourself. Jesus can. And that's all you really need to believe. And you're all right. You're, you're added in fellowship with everybody else who's at least got to that point. Now, that's where Shelley is. Some of us years ago, because you're very logical mind, that he wanted to be able to stay where he was in 1984. Because he's not going to continue to logically carry his position out to its ultimate conclusion, and he's gotten there. He can do this with the Muslims and the Jews. About all he's saying is about like Paul Tillich taught, a uh, modernist, was 
thing. Whatever culture you're in, environment determines what religion you're in. And if you're sincere in that religion, whatever God is, you, how far is Shelley from that? So we'll stay adjourn for the next 10 minutes to the bottom of the hour. Thank you.